where we'll be. Uh, I told our Sunday school class it's going to be a little bit different day uh, because we do have church camp coming up. It's the next two weeks uh, of July as our as our junior camp is this week, and then senior camp is uh, the following week. Then we come back for a week, and then we have VBS. And in the midst of that, I have at least one missionary coming uh, to preach for us. It's just going to be a really kind of crazy uh, a few weeks, but good, a uh, good, good few weeks. Um, but I decided there's been something on my heart regarding camp, and I, I want to preach a message today, and I didn't even really know what, a ti- what to title it. I ended up titling it Mystery of the Mountaintop. I don't know if that just sounds really ridiculous, or it, but I, I think you'll get the idea of, of what I'm trying to say this morning, what the thought that I believe the Lord's given me uh, in regards to church camp. I'm going to use a passage here, Luke 22, and then we'll also be in Matthew chapter 13. So you might as well just put a finger in Matthew 13 as well. And when we read these, you're going to immediately go, what does that have to do with a mountaintop or a mystery? Uh, but don't worry too much about the, the title and all of that. I just I think it'll all tie together as we go along. But Luke chapter 22, if you found your place there, if you'll stand with me just one more time for the honor of reading God's word. We'll just read verse 31 and 32. The Bible says here, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Lord, I'm asking again, as I have throughout the morning, for your help. And uh, Lord, I know that uh, if, if I get up here and just say things that have come from my head, Lord, it's not going to be a help to anyone. We really just need your word to speak today. And so I pray that, that that would be exactly what happens. I pray your word would just be lifted up among us, that we'd understand it, that we take heed to it. And Lord, just as I approach this thought of, of praying for our, our campers this, this coming two weeks, And even for the VBS that's coming up, Lord, as we give ourselves to prayer for these things, I just pray you'd help us to see the significance of that. And uh, Lord, I just pray you'd bless the day and get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In the context of this verse, um, the the disciples are with Jesus, and it's getting very near um, the end of Jesus' ministry. In fact, um, on the very next page of my Bible, depending on how your Bible is laid out, but on the very next page of my Bible, the Lord is betrayed and arrested, and he's brought over there to, to do all those false trials. And then before you know it, he is on the cross. And so this is just right at the end of his ministry. And in fact, if you'll just back up to verse 19 of our, our text chapter there, you'll see that this is when he's in the upper room and he's breaking the bread and, and he's, he's having this time with his disciples. He's, he's instituting the Lord's Supper. That's verse 19 and 20. And then he tells them of one that will betray, them, betray him, of course, speaking of uh, Judas. And then down in verse 24, the disciples don't disappoint. They uh, start to argue about, again, who is going to be the greatest. And they're concerned uh, the Lord's teaching them all these really deep and, and uh, meaningful and should be impactful and even emotional things. And, and they're worried about, you know, who is going to be uh, the greatest. And, and in verse number 27, the Lord says, For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth, it is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. And so the Lord has given them this example of service and greatness in the kingdom is through servanthood and, and through serving one another. And then he, he turns over to Peter. And it's interesting, um, he just deals with Peter for just a little bit here. And, he, and, he, and so what these verses are doing is, is the Lord is, is um, he, he's telling Peter, Peter, I have a job for you to do. I, I have a will for your life. There, there's something that I'm going to trust you and count on you and desire for you, will for you to do. And that is that when you, thou art converted, verse 32, strengthen thy brethren. And, and we don't have a lot of time to get into the, the specifics there, but what he's talking about, he's, he's talking about that time when Peter would receive the Holy Spirit and then take the church that Christ had started and continue it. He's, he's telling him, uh, he's, in another passage, he tells him he's given him the keys of the kingdom. And, and so it's all related there that, Peter, when I'm gone and you receive the Holy Spirit, I have got a work that I want you to do. So the first thing I see in this passage is that God has a desire 
for Peter. God has a desire for this individual disciple. He's been speaking to all the disciples, but right now he's really uh, zooming in on Peter. He's like, I got a desire for you. I have a, a plan for you. I have a will for you. And I believe that that would be the case for every single person in this room. You know, there are things that the Bible just tells us to do that we know to be the known will of God. That's the will of God for everyone. But then God has a plan for us. He has a plan for our life. He has a desire for us. He has something that he wants us to do. When I think about this, I, I, and then I, I think about church camp, and it'll take me a minute to just sort of uh, get my thoughts out so you know where I'm going. I've often asked myself some questions and, and made some observations over the years in regards to church camp. At the very beginning, when I was, um, I was still uh, bivocational, but at the very beginning when I got into the ministry, I was a youth pastor. I was a youth pastor for a number of years. And camp always made me scratch my head. And I, I have kind of wrestled with these thoughts over the years. And, and I've thought this, what is it that is different about church camp? What's different? Um, and th this will be a different message today, obviously. We're, we're talking about something that's happening here. We're all going to camp in the next couple of weeks. But why do the teenagers at church camp respond to the preaching in such a different way than they would respond to the preaching back home. You know, as a youth pastor, it was, um, it was very frustrating. And, and I, don't mean it, uh, I don't mean that when someone got saved, I got frustrated. But you realize I preached every single week to those kids, the gospel. The go every single week I preached and I preached. And every single week I told them, don't listen to that music and, and, and don't you know, say those words. Every week I preached from the scriptures the truths that uh, that they should know and so then we go to church camp and in which i always loved as a as a youth pastor taking kids up to church camp we get up there to church camp and that they had this real fancy preacher not really he's just a regular preacher but you know what i mean he's like the preacher for the week and he'd get up there and he'd say you know what you kids you need to get saved and you need to stop listening to that music and you need to do and he'd just say all the things i had said the other 360 days of the year and all these kids would just flock down to the altar and they'd be giving up their music and they'd be getting saved and they'd be, uh, you know, uh, surrendering to be a missionary and, and all that. And I'm thinking, you bozos didn't listen to me the other weeks of the year. What's the what's the deal now? And I mean, maybe that's my own sin that I'd rather them listen to me. And I got, maybe I have some part in that. But I always thought, what is the deal? Why now are you making that decision? It's kind of frustrating. It's the mystery of the mountaintop. Um, and by the way, I saw kids make life-changing decisions at church camp every year. But then they get home. And you know where I'm going. They get home. And it seems like for a few days, they're doing pretty good. They're reading their Bibles. They're on fire. Their lives have been changed. But as a youth guy, I would just notice after a couple of weeks, they're back to the way they were. And, and it just caused me to question, what in the world's going on? What, what is the mystery that happens up there? And I say mountaintop because most camps, you go up into the mountains somewhere. And I saw this happen, I, and I'm just trying to, again, this is just, th this is a way different message than normally, I, normally I'm in a text, and I just trudge through the text. But I, I'm, I'm trying to share with you some thoughts the Lord's placed on my heart, and I think it'll be a help. I started to see this happen. I started to see um, church members become skeptical of church camp. Because little Johnny, well, there's no one named Johnny in here, is there? Okay, good. Little Johnny would go up to camp. Before he went to camp, he was, you know, you know, he wasn't saved, or he, maybe he was saved, but he wasn't acting right, wasn't obeying his parents, rebellious, whatever. He goes up to camp, and little Johnny decides at camp he's going to be a missionary. He comes home from camp, and two or three weeks later, he's back to that same crowd, and he's 
back to doing the thing. It seems like he doesn't even remember that he ever went to church camp. And the people in the pew, the, 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 uh, the membership of the church, they would become skeptical. Well, those decisions they made up there at camp must not have been genuine. You got them all emotionally excited about something and, and they made some decision, but it must not have been genuine because look at them now. But folks, I knelt beside little Johnny at church camp. And I watched him bawl his eyes out. And I listened to him confess his sin to God. And I saw a change, a real change in his heart. And it always frustrated me when we get back and we would usually have a, a time where the kids could come and I'd give a little testimony and they'd give their testimony. And it's almost like the people of the church would go, okay, here we go. There come these camp testimonies. Let's hear what God's done. And they almost just expect it's just all going to go away in a couple weeks. Has anyone experienced anything like that? Okay. So it just, this thing just bugged me for years and drove me to think, what is going on? How can I change this? Because I truly believe the decisions that were made up there on the mountain were real decisions. I mean, I, I know young people that are saved today because they went to church camp. And yes, I preach to them the gospel for, uh, you know, 51 weeks of the year. By the way, why do you think all of a sudden that thing sprouted? There had been some planting going on all year. You know, here's what, as a youth pastor, I used to get frustrated, which I don't know if there's any youth pastors in here, but I, when I preach to them, I would say, don't get frustrated with that weekly planting and watering of seeds. And then all of a sudden, because it happens in church too. A preacher preaches, 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 preaches. Then you have a revival and people start getting their hearts right. Right? But there's that weekly planting, weekly watering. So all the work is worthwhile. But it... I just knew the decisions were real. And I thought, why, why do they go back? Because it is true. They do. A lot of times they do. They make a decision. I can think in my mind, I got pictures of three or four kids right now that made a big decision for Christ. And, and I'm, I'm telling you, they're not where they said they were going to go today. It happens. Why does it happen? What is it about church camp that's different? Why do students respond to messages better? Why, why do the decisions not ever stick? And then I want to ask this question, and maybe for us that, because you're sitting here like, well, I'm not even going to church camp. Why should I be listening to this? There's two things that I want you to get out of this this morning. One is, I want you to understand that what happens on the mountaintop is no mystery. And it can happen here. It can happen every week. It can happen every time you open your Bible. The very same thing can happen. It's no mystery. It's more of a recipe. The second thing I want you to know is that God has a desire for each individual kid that's going to be going to camp over the next two weeks. There's six junior campers. There's three or maybe four senior campers going. God has a desire, a plan for each one of them. Just as the Lord told Peter here, I have this desire. When, when, this is my will for you. When, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, the desire that he had for Peter was a, a unique desire. He wanted Peter to do, specifically do something in the early church. But God has a desire for each and every one of us. And I want you to understand this. God has a desire. He has a plan. He has a will for all of these young people that will be going to camp over the next two weeks. He has something that he wants them to do with their life. And no matter what is preached, I can almost guarantee you that desire will start coming up to the surface in their heart. I mean, it, I, I've sat through so many camps. I, I think I was telling my wife, uh, we've, we've been going to camps since I was, well, when I was a kid, I went to camp my whole life. And then when I was about 20 years old, I started taking kids to camp. And I think I've taken kids to camp every year since. I've sat through a lot of sermons at camp. Let me just tell you, 
They're preaching the same stuff we preach here. They're, they're, it's, just, it's just a book. There's no fancy sermons. It seems like they're just, but they're just, they're just straightforward sermons out of the Bible. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, it matters what's being preached, but the preacher can pick his topic of choice. What happens during that week is kids, the desires that God has for them, it starts bubbling up in their heart. You know, no one ever preached to me, you need to be a pastor. No one ever preached that to me. But as I sat under the preaching of God's word and as I was in his word, that desire that God had started showing itself in my heart. But here's what I want you to know. Satan also has a desire for these kids. Did you notice that in our text? It said, the Lord said to Simon, Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. In other words, Satan would like, Peter, he would like to destroy you. He would like to make sure, he would like to make sure that um, that you never do the thing that I want you to do. He would like to sift you as wheat. He would like to destroy your life. He would like to foul up the plan that I have for you. So understand we're taking some kids to camp. God has a desire for them. So does Satan. Satan wants to destroy our kids. Satan wants to take... The, you know, God has a plan for their life. He wants to take and just mess that plan up as best as he knows how. That's what he wants to do. That's his desire. He wants them to go to camp, and, or he doesn't want them to go to camp, but they're going to camp. Uh, I'm telling you, if he could flatten every tire, and why do you think so many church buses die on the way to camp? You think it's Satan. It's actually poor maintenance. Churches just don't have good maintenance programs. No, it, I joke, but it, it seems like every year something's blowing up on the way to camp. The van runs good all year. Go to camp, the radiator fails. I was going to camp one year, it started raining real bad. Turned on the windshield wipers, they went, Boop, and then they wouldn't move. Both of them just, and it's pouring down rain and the windshield wipers wouldn't move. We pulled in under an overpass and I don't know what we did. We finally got them working every year. See, he wants to ruin that camp experience. If, 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 he, if he could just keep us from getting there, he would do that. But we're going to get there. And then once we get there, he, he wants to confuse the message and, and keep from happening what is going to happen. Usually at camp, and this is what I'm going to get to, usually he loses that battle. Because of what I'm going to share with you in a minute. But he is waiting for them. When they get home. Why do you think little Johnny goes back to his old ways? Because Satan desires to sift him as wheat. And he might not can reach him in the mountain, but he is waiting for him when he gets home. So God has a desire. Satan has a desire. The Bible does still say, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. There may be young people this week that need to be saved. Maybe from our church, maybe from other churches. There's, there's some kids that need to be saved this week. Maybe their youth pastor's been preaching to them all year about salvation, and so they got the facts, and they got that, and they're starting to get a little bit of conviction, and maybe there's time for some, some you know, reaping. Maybe it's time for them to actually get saved, and they're ripe. And maybe they will. Maybe there's some kids that need to be saved this week. Satan desires they'd be sifted as wheat. There may be some young people this week that need to make decisions for the Lord. Um, we're not exactly seeing hundreds of thousands of preachers made every year. When one kid goes to camp and says, I want to be a preacher, listen, don't be skeptical. Encourage. We need him to make it. So God has a desire. Satan has a desire. It's interesting here that Jesus said he wants to sift you as wheat. He used this crop illustration. And so I'd have you turn back to Matthew chapter 13. 
And I just want to connect a couple of dots because what happens at camp is, is no secret. It's that the seed is sown. It's that the seed is sown. So what I expect to happen, and I've never been to this camp, uh, it, it's a new experience for me, but what I expect to happen is for there to be a lot of Bible at camp. I, I expect for the seed to be sown. I expect for there to be preaching and teaching and memorization and, and uh, uh, just, just different times of the day and different times of the week when the seed will be sown. And when the seed is sown, there are certain things that happen. There are certain outcomes that, that may occur when the gospel is presented. Matthew chapter 13, Jesus puts forth a parable. And I just want to read it to you. And then we're going to go through it for the next few moments. And then I'm gonna, I've got a charge for you as a church family regarding our campers. And, and then we'll be done. But look at verse, thir- verse 1 of chapter 13. The same day went Jesus out of it, the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him so that he went into a ship and sat And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside. And the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Go down to verse number 18. We're going to look now at the four types of soil. So the Lord already illustrated this in parable form. He said the sower, he goes out to sow. And what we're going to find in verse 18 and 19 is that sower is the one who is giving out the word of God. So the, you can imagine the gospel, the preaching of the, the Bible, this is the sowing, this is the, the planting. He's, he's throwing the seeds. And so uh, if you've ever seen one of those uh, Old Testament uh, t- farming uh, videos or, or, or looked at anything about that, um, they would wear this sack around uh, their shoulder that would hold the seed and they would. Uh, there was a special way to do it. I mean, they didn't have those, you know, when I, I'm from farming country and I'm telling you, we got machinery now that will plant a seed every six inches, one and a half inches deep and put a, just a much, I mean, just, they're just driving the track. Actually, they don't even drive the tractor. They sit there and the GPS drives the tractor and it puts a seed everywhere it goes. That's not how they did it back in the day. But there was a process because you can't just dump the seed on the ground and, and you want to plant it and spread it out. So they would, they would uh, hold this bag and be around there and they, they, they'd take the seed and they would kind of go one, two, take a step, one, two. Take a step. One, two, and if they were good at it, they'd spread that seed out just perfectly along the ground. And, and that's the picture of the sower. He's walking through and he's planting the seed. This is the idea is that this would be the Christian or the preacher or Jesus Christ in this case. And he's going through and he's just preaching the gospel. He's just giving it out. He's handing it out, spreading it around to everyone around him. He's sowing the seed. It's the word. We see then that that seed lands in four different types of soil. And depending on where the seed lands affects the outcome of the seed and what it can do. Now, this is a message that really gets to me because I can't grow anything. I've tried. I've tried growing stuff. It just doesn't work. I don't care what kind of soil you give me. I will kill it. But apparently, there are four different types of seed that this, or, or soil that this spiritual seed can land on. And I believe we can learn something about the mystery on the mountain from this parable. Look in verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catch, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So if you remember in the first verse three and four where we read this parable, the seed goes over by the wayside. It, it, it doesn't fall into the good ground. It's, it's over there and it's exposed. And what happens is the birds come and they snatch it up. Now, not every instance in the Bible, but many instances in the Bible, the birds are represented of the devil or of uh, wicked spirits. And so uh, what's happening here is the seed is sown. The good word is going out. But just as soon as it might be understood, the wicked one comes and snatches it up. This happens a lot of times on Sunday morning. 
preacher preaches a message, and I'm not just talking about here, I'm talking about all over the place, the preacher preaches a message, there's, there's conviction in the heart, there's a, there's a, oh man, the Lord really spoke to me, Did, uh, that, that passage is really making sense, and then someone will get in their car and turn on, and there'll be something on the radio. It may not even be a bad thing on the radio, but there'll be something there that distracts. It takes the seed away. The person drives home, the conviction leaves. The, the distractions of the world. I don't know if it's music or entertainment or the little, the little red circles on our phone that are always distracting us and the, the social media and the texting and, and all those things. If we're not careful, we'll snatch away the truth of the word. This, we're in danger of this today. Whenever I get up tomorrow morning and read my Bible, I'll be in danger of it then. Guess what happens when I read my Bible? I try to take time. You set aside all things and, and you just take some time with the Lord. But listen, this life is distracting, is it not? And the, before long, the truth that God has sowed in your heart, the wicked one, he wants to sift us like wheat. And he's waiting to snatch away the truth. Distractions. Another distraction, Jesus experienced this, familiarity. You know why it's good to have different preachers come through here? One preacher told me it's good for you to get away a few times a year and have other preachers come. You know why that is? Familiarity. You get used to the sound of my ranting and raving. Oh, that's just Pastor, I say Jeremy, because my dad is Brother Gilbert, but you guys call me Brother Pastor Gilbert. That's great. That's fine. I'm getting old. It's all good. But, oh, that's just him. We're used to how he does it. He does it the same every week. I don't know any other way to do it. I'm sorry. I could, if I could do it different, different times, I probably would. I just, you got what you got. But there's a, that's why a youth pastor will preach to his kids all year. Then they'll go hear someone else who has a different sounding voice, and all of a sudden they go, wait, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. Familiarity. It's interesting, even that, even that can be a deterrent from us receiving the word. You want to know the mystery of the mountain? None of those things exist at church camp. There are no cell phones. There is no social media. There is no worldly music. I mean, everywhere these kids turn, they're going to be faced with God. They're going to, every music that's sung, every hymn that's sung, every, every, when they turn this way or that way, there's going to be uh, devotions going on over here. There's going to be biblical singing going on over here. There's going to be preaching going on over here. There's no distractions. The birds are gone. So the word has time to settle in. It's not really a mystery. You know what that tells me? I got to work to get distractions out of my life. If I want to have that mountaintop experience, I have got to work to take distractions out of my life. I'm telling you, it happens to me all the time. God will be working on me. I'll be uh, reading. I'll be making notes. I'll be really enjoying the presence of the Lord. And then the phone will ding. And there it goes. It would probably do us good to just shut the thing off. Put it in the safe. Close the door. Leave the house. Go somewhere else and read our Bible. Why do I say all that? Because if you know where the safe is and you know the code, you'll go back in there and get the thing back out. Distractions. So i got to hurry. That's the first soil. The second soil is the stony place, is verse 20. Um, but he that receives seed into the stony place is the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet he hath no root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So tribulation and persecution. So someone who hears the word of God, they, they understand the truth, they receive it with joy. They're glad about it. But then they get out into the world and they realize, oh wait, the rest of the world doesn't like this thing. The rest of the world's very hostile to this thing of the gospel. The rest of the world doesn't like me to be a Christian. Worldly influences, old friends. You know what's interesting? Those kids will carry their Bible all week at camp. You're weird if you don't have a Bible at camp. But try to carry that to school Monday. 
Just try it. I carried my Bible in college. You, you wouldn't believe how many looks I got. I mean, I just did it. Just I don't know. I just thought I, did, I wasn't even reading it. Most of the time, just carrying it. They think, who is this weirdo? And tribulation and persecution arises because of the word. And by and by, they're offended. You know what, at camp? The, there's no negative peer pressure. Or at least there's very little. Sometimes there is. I mean, we are dealing with teenagers. And, and some smaller than that. But at camp, if you decide, you know what, I'm going to take some time over here by myself and I'm read my Bible. No one thinks a negative thought about it. They all go, man, that guy's reading his Bible. That's great. The stony places are eliminated at camp for the most part. You still deal with stuff. Let me just tell you, I've been to some camp experiences where the devil made his way up there and he brought all some of these things and we had a fight on the mountain. Um, I could tell you stories, but it's, you, you don't need to hear all my stories. No, at camp, there is a encouragement for godly things, not a discouragement. Okay, thorns, verse 22. Um, where are we? Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. In the care of this world, in the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he become unfruitful. So here we have the care of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches. So we could include, well, the care of the world includes many things. It includes, a, 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 well, the sinful world that we're um, uh, surrounded by, that we're living in, the temptation to sin that is everywhere uh, in our society. It's, it's always in front of our face. But just, just the care of the world, really, the, just the mindset of the world that rests on us. Does that make sense to you folks that there is a mindset of this world that just rests on us? I mean, you feel it when you watch the news. You feel it when you're out in public. It's just the, the perceptions and the ideology and, and the worldliness that, that, that living in Satan's world is oppressive to the Christian. The cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. Um. At church camp, the preacher is never going to get up and, and preach about how you need to have a strong 401k. He's never going to get up and preach about how you better make X amount of dollars if you want to be happy in this life. Or you need to be this sort of financially whatever if, if, if you're going to be successful. Success is defined much differently there than it is here. I was in uh, New York City. We were uh, with a group. We were handing out tracks in the subway. And this, this uh, young lady that I know, she's good grief. She's married with children now. <laughs> she was one of my kids in the youth uh, when I was younger. And she was, I taught her as a, she was one of my youth kids. And so now I feel really old uh, thinking about this. But back before all that, she was handing out tracks in the subway. And I'll never forget this there's some mean folks in this world. And they saw this poor little girl, you know, and, and she went over to her and she said, she put her finger in her face and said, you are wasting your life. You need to go and go to college and get a good career and a good job because you're going to end up broke and unhappy because you're, you know, waiting. of course, this is an unbeliever. Do you know the world preaches a whole different message than the word of God does? My desire for my children is not that they grow up to be rich. Rich people are miserable too. Maybe more miserable. And by the way, if you uh, decide to become a pastor or a missionary, which is heavily encouraged at church camp, um, there is no promise of riches in that. In fact, there's a promise for pretty much the opposite. I've had... I almost hate to mention it because I know people... Uh, from other places, listen, but I've had young people surrender their lives to go be a missionary, surrender their lives to be a pastor, whatever. I've had it happen several times. They get home and mom and dad say, well, how are you going to make a living? That's just, that's no way to make a living. You can't make a living being a missionary. What are you thinking? And you know, you know why little Johnny goes back a lot of times? 
I'm just being honest. It's because mom and dad are worried that little Johnny won't have enough money. That's it. It's just a different message being preached up there. Jesus said you cannot serve God and mammon. You have to choose. I'm telling you, I can name young people that should be on the mission field, and they're not because they were discouraged when they got home because you need to go do this career. Or you need to know before you left, you were on this path. You know what? I went to three years of college to be a, an investment banker. I actually finished. I, people ask me where I got my education. I tell them Texas Tech, and they're like, you're a pastor? God can change your plan. He can change your plan. I'm just glad that when I told my parents the Lord's calling me to ministry, that my dad didn't sit me down and go, now, son, you've put three years into this degree. And, you know, you just need to stick with that and go that way. You know what my dad said? Well, you're going to have to go to Bible college. You're going to have to change your plan. Again, the soil is different at camp. Notice the fourth type of soil. I want you to notice something about this fourth type of soil. If the seed lands in this type of soil, it will always produce fruit. Notice verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. There is no mystery behind what happens at church camp. It is a biblical truth. If the soil is right, the seed will bring forth fruit. You know what church camps do? They plow the soil. They get rid of the distractions. And they get rid of the stony places. And they get rid of the weeds. And our children are immersed for a few days in nothing but Bible, reading, preaching, memorization, prayer, encouragement. And listen, it is works it brings forth fruit but kids come home from camp and the soil at home is much different from what they just experienced and it takes a lot of strength for a young person 15 16 years old to come home and fight off all the world by themselves and keep the commitments that they've made there's no mystery Ladies and gentlemen, if you want the word to bring forth fruit in your life, there's no mystery. Prepare the soil. You can't be worried about the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. You can't be worried about the, the opposition that you will face. You, you can't be distracted by everything around you. If you eliminate those things and plow the soil, the seed brings forth fruit. Let me show you one other passage and then we'll be done. Look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. I, I said that, you know, man, preachers lie a lot. I, we're going to be here and then we're going to go back to our text. Okay. And then we'll be done because you got to see the rest of it. That's the, that's the whole point. But if, if God's word isn't bringing forth fruit in your life, here's a solution. Here's how you prepare the soil. Okay. Luke 13, verse six. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? I just want to pause and say, I hope the Lord can't come visit our life and say the same. Man, I keep coming and inspecting his life and I just, I'm not finding any fruit. Um, the, the keeper of the tree said, he answered, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after thou shall cut it down. Notice what he said. Let me dig about it and dung it. Now, those terms are really 
different. Well, at least one of them is. What he's saying is, let me remove the soil around the outside of that tree. Let me, let me fix the soil. Let me dig about it. Let me get rid of the old hard soil. That doesn't have nutrients. That's obviously not helping this tree. Let's get rid of those things away from the tree. And then let's dung it, which, which that was their fertilizer then. He's like, then let's put some dung around the tree. Let's put some fertilizer. Let's put some, let's put some good things around the tree. Let's give it some ch another chance to bear fruit. You see, it's all about the soil's preparation. Whether or not that tree bears fruit. He says, dig about it. Dung. Listen, there's some things in your life you need to dig out. You want God to speak to you? You want God to change your life? You want fruit to be uh, in your life? Listen, there's some things sometimes we got to dig about the tree. I've got to remove things out of my life that are causing distraction. I've got to remove cares and, 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 again, those other three types of soil, stones and, and weeds, and, and, and I've got to get the birds out of my life. If I ever want to see God do anything, I've got I to gotta dig about the tree, but not, not, that's not good enough. Then you've got to dung it. If you just remove the stuff around the tree, what happens? Something else will fill that spot. You're in Gillette. You know the wind blows 100 miles an hour here. It won't take five minutes for stuff to blow in there, fill it all up again. When we remove those things from our life, we've got to replace those things with good things. Say, you know that TV show I've been watching? The Lord's told me in my heart it's not good for me. Dig about it. Get rid of it. But then you're going to have to replace that time. And you want to replace it with something good for the tree. It's no mystery. It, it's really no secret. Most of our hearts are so cumbered with weeds and rocks and birds. We couldn't hear the Lord speak if we wanted to. When we take young people to camp, I'm telling you what happens is the tree is dug around and it's dunged around. And fruit happens. So now, back to our text. And I want you to, because you can have a part. I'm, I'm going to skip a whole page of my notes. You're welcome. <laughs> back to Luke 22 for just a second. I would hope each individual person here would say, you know what, I want that sort of camp experience. I know I'm not going to camp, but I want the Lord to speak to me that way. I want to respond to the Lord that way. It's just, it's just a simple formula. Prepare the soil. But here's what I, this is my charge to you, church. This is my, if, you're, if you, you don't take anything from the message today, here is my charge. Here's what I, as your pastor, would like you to do this couple of weeks. I want you to pray for the campers that are going. I want you to pray for them. They are going to enter into a spiritual battle starting tomorrow around 2 p.m., maybe sooner on the drive. But I'm telling you, there's a, the devil wants to sift them as wheat, and God wants to change their life. And we need to pray. You know, a lot can happen if a church is praying for its campers. I believe out of the 10 or so campers that we'll have there, I believe God could call some of them into full-time ministry. I believe God wants to use every single one of them for His purpose somewhere, somehow. They need a church to come alongside them and pray. They need a church to come alongside. Listen, when they come back and they've made decisions, don't be skeptical. Encourage. Make sure the soil here is ready for them to come back. And, and man, don't pour cold water on what God does to them at camp just because you don't understand what happens at camp. The soil is right there. Mom and dad, your kid comes home and Oh, I've got to, I, I want to do this with my life. I believe this is what God's telling me. And you're worried. Well, how are you going to pay the bills? Listen, they'll probably worry about that too, but God pays the bills. God works it out. So look back at our text, Luke 22. 
32. Actually, just look at verse 31 again. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Verse 32, I love a good conjunction, but I, Jesus, I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Jesus prayed for Peter. Peter, I got something I want you to do. The devil does not want you to do that thing. And you are going to struggle. In fact, he, he's about to tell him, you're going to deny me three times. And of course, Peter denies that he will deny him. And then he does deny him three times. But I've prayed for you, Peter. Satan's not going to get his way. And listen, just... 40-something days later, Peter stood on the day of Pentecost and preached, and 3,000 people were saved. Peter took the gospel to the Jew, the Samaritan, and to the uttermost, to the Gentile, to the uttermost part of the earth, because Jesus prayed for him. The devil has a desire for the weak. His desire is the bus wouldn't even make it there. The kids would be distracted. There'd be conflict and drama and turmoil. Uh, his desire is that when they would get back, that there would be uh, improper soil there, distraction there. His desire is for this couple of weeks to mean nothing to these young people. Could we do something to change that? By praying. So my charge to you, and I'm asking you, will you pray for our campers? Every day, pray. Pray that they understand God's will and that Satan is not allowed on that mountain. Pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. I know it's a different message, but Lord, our, my desire is, Lord, that you would do a work at camp. I know it's, it's my first time at this camp and not even knowing all what to expect, but I know, I know that your word will be preached and I know that there'll be opportunity for adults and children alike to respond to the messages. I know that you have a will for each person and I know Satan has a desire to destroy it. Lord, I pray that you would be with our young people this next two weeks. Lord, I pray you'd be with the preachers that will be preaching. Would you prepare their hearts to preach the messages that you've laid upon them lord would you help them not to be distracted but to be fully given to the the work that they'll be doing this week i pray that your power will be evident in the services in the counseling and even in the times of fun at camp lord that you would just be all around i pray you'd be with those counselors that it will be dealing directly with the kiddos I pray that you'd be with each, each young person as well. For those this week that need to get saved and next week as well that need to get saved, Lord, I just pray you would make it just so clear to them that they could not mistake it, that they'd get saved. Lord, I, I pray that those that you want to call into your work, those that need to repent of some sin, and Lord, whatever, whatever you're wanting to do this week, we pray you would do it that you would get the victory every moment of the day while we're away. Lord, we pray that you would bar the devil from this place, that you would protect these kids, put a hedge about us. We just pray for an effective youth camp. And Lord, I pray you'd rem remind each of us over the next two weeks to be praying and to be lifting up um, those that are going. And uh, Lord, would your will be done. Father, as we move to a time of invitation now, <clears throat> we just pray that you'd continue to work in our hearts where we can experience the same sort of fruit in our lives. Help us to learn where we need to dig out the soil or dung it. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.